Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to another episode of Voices for Excellence. I am your host, Dr. Michael Connor, CEO and founder of the Agile Evolutionary Group and proud host of Voices for Excellence. And today's guest, haven't seen him in a long time. I think in person was before COVID, but uh, when I was a superintendent during COVID, uh, Mr. Eric Scheniger had helped me out tremendously. And this is where uh, I got to play around. I like to say tinker around professional learning to incorporate technology and how we can move forward in now the AC stage of education with revolutionizing, personalizing, and differentiating uh, professional learning. It gave me that aspect or that dimension of how we can move it forward, Eric, around professional learning. But broadly, you are a national, I should say international, thought leader, partner, friend, top-notch educator. Everybody leans on him. So it is with great honor to welcome Mr. Eric Schettiger, who is the CEO and founder of Inspired Change EDU. Eric, I, I haven't seen you in forever, brother. How you doing, man? Uh, Dr. Connor, it has been a whirlwind. But, you know, it's great to be here. And as we think when we saw each other many, many years ago at the Model Schools Conference, a lot has changed in those four to five years. And, you know, I'm excited to really dive in and really talk about not just how do we navigate this change, but how do we thrive in it and and really prepare the next generation of thinkers, doers, inventors, and creators that are relying on us as educators to create relevant, meaningful, challenging environments that don't prepare them for something, but prepare them for anything. Absolutely. Eric, it's so good to hear your voice and so good to see you. Like I said, the last time uh, we had a really deep, deep, deep conversation was during the midst of the pandemic. And we were still trying to figure out how to navigate through the novelties of the pandemic. But now, more importantly, uh, we're trying to identify strategies and approaches to navigate the novelty of the future. So good to have you. And I'll tell you this, man, um, I'm going to call you Mr. Nostradamus, because I'll tell you, in the BC stage of education before COVID-19, uh, you were talking about artificial intelligence and emerging technologies uh, in the operating model, the standard operating model in education. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, wow, Eric said that about 10 years ago. <laughs> no, I, I wish I wish I had a crystal ball that helped me accurate, pre accurately predict financial markets and things like that, as well as I hit that nail on the head, because then, oh, my goodness. But, you know, I mean, we look at all these disruptive forces and you know, it, it's so interesting. We we talk, we talk, and and then they eventually do become part of our reality. And sometimes they happen a lot more quickly than we are ready for. Uh, and that kind of happened with the invention of the chalkboard. We weren't really ready for that, and it revolutionized how we instruct. And then we look at all these other phenomena. But yeah, it, it's interesting to see, you know, no matter what changes, the, the thing we have to ask is, you know, are we grounding our practice in what we know about effective teaching, learning, and leadership? And how do we become more comfortable with getting uncomfortable in order to do what we're already doing better? Absolutely. That whole aspect of learn to unlearn to relearn, Eric, and we'll get into that uh, more deeply in the actual podcast episode. But first question is always a fun question, Eric. And I cannot wait, cannot wait to see what your response is. Because Me too. I, I can't wait to see what I, what I try to respond. Eric, you are well known, whether it be uh, domestically or internationally with your work, Eric, a thought partner, a thought leader that many trust in the education ecosystem and your practices are innovative in the context of moving beyond the traditional measures in education. But, but, Mr. Scheniger, what stone defines you and your work within the industry? Oh, that's easy. I'm from Jersey. So what do you think it is? Oh, don't get it, don't very, get it wrong. Oh, Bruce? Don't get, no, no, come on. If it's not Bruce, it's... Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. Okay. Song for me is living on a prayer. 
Woo! Well, we're always trying to get there. Maybe not always halfway, but we never really make it to our destination. And I love that song just because it brings back so many memories and I love my Jersey roots. But mm -hmm. every time I listen to it, I just sing along. I'm inspired. And I mean, that's typically the song when I'm asked, what is your walk, walk up song? I use Bon Jovi, the living on a prayer, you know, and there's a secondary song too, which is another fan favorite is, uh, don't stop believing, you know? And I, I think when we, we look at journey and that song, you know, listen, things are going to, we're going to get curveballs. We're going to swing and miss. There's going to be frustration. But we don't want to stop believing because, yes, we can do it as educators. We can overcome adversity. But most importantly, our learners and our staff, regardless of your position, if you're a teacher or administrator, they need us to never stop believing that we can get better. Absolutely. I, I, I love that. Living on a Prayer, Bon Jovi, that is an all-time classic, Eric. But when we talk about don't stop believing, right, and – I like to say with these compounding uh, forces, you had uh, talked about these disruptive forces, but also compounding forces that leaders, um, administrators engage in constantly, specifically now uh, as we're in this past uh, COVID phase, this AC stage of education, we have to continue to uh, deepen our belief systems. We have to continue to deepen our value systems to ensure that this progress, right, and defining progress every day uh, does not um, create this, st this stymie with, within the work. So absolutely, Eric, do not stop believing. I tell you, and, and living on a prayer, I live on a prayer every day, brother. <laughs> yeah, I think we all do to some extent. <laughs> oh, man, that is great. And Eric, all right, listen, I, I, I left out a, 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 key, a key aspect in the introduction. You are a national bestseller selling author, right? And and Eric, I'm going to tell you, man, I used to reference your books, still reference your books. But when I was a superintendent, when I was a principal, I'll tell you, learning transformed in digital leadership, digital leadership. This was, we're, we're talking about practices of digital leadership now, right? When we look at artificial intelligence, when we look at generative intelligence and LLMs, um, large language models, Eric, you were talking about this before the pandemic. I mean, even I, I'm, when I'm like, when I was an assistant principal, and that was a while ago, Eric. So your books, I've underscored those strategies and those concepts and many educators as well, but you forecasted this and who would ever have figured the evolution and the revolution of technology would take off in this AC stage of education. But within your latest publication, your latest book, disruptive thinking in our classrooms, preparing learners for our future. How, how do we ensure that we're preparing schools, district leaders, uh, practitioners to be ready for this Delta 2030 stage? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. You know, you, you bring up digital leadership and technology should be a huge aspect of what we do, but it, it, there's still this sense of resistance. And when we look at everything, I mean, I got my... Uh, appliance guy coming over in a little bit to fix my refrigerator that's totally digital i don't even know where to begin i mean we could control things and with our phones so I, I think it's looking at you know first and foremost you know how do we do what we're already doing better and how do we leverage technology in a purposeful way but to your point about you know disruptive thinking in our classrooms uh i think we all know that none of us were prepared for the pandemic I, I, we can even go say that no one was prepared for the Apple IIe, the floppy disk, the CD, Netflix, uh, uh, you know, streaming services. But when we look right now, no one was prepared for the pandemic. And you could also say that people are, are not prepared to either seize on the opportunity or be cognizant of maybe some of the more... Uh, negative aspects of artificial intelligence. I mean, you can look at both sides of the, 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 the story here, but are we prepared for these disruptive forces? And what we have realized is disruption is going to keep happening at such a incremental level. We need to get used to it. But how does that translate to practice in our classrooms, in our schools, in our districts? 
You know, disruptive thinking is the ability of our learners to replace conventional ideas with innovative solutions to authentic problems. When I coined that definition, it really is looking at, okay, COVID-19, artificial intelligence, that could be an authentic problem or an authentic opportunity. And the whole idea is how do we translate that into the classroom where our learners aren't becoming skilled, but they're becoming competent. Competency is taking knowledge, skills, but also behavior, disposition, mindset. So it really gives us the opportunity to reflect on our practice, to think about, well, not what we do, but why do we do it that way? How might we do it better? And what tells us that we're successful? Because the goal is the future-proof learning for our kids to be prepared for any disruptive force that comes our way. Yeah, Eric, great point, because um, one of the, I like to say, navigating factors that we have to take in consideration is, and and I still think we're, um, we're still stuck in that linear perspective of developing skills, as opposed to developing this holistic approach with um, competencies, right? And I think that one of the disjunctions that we see is we still see didactopedagogical methods, but in reality, we have to develop competencies um, as we move forward in the future proofing, right? I want you just to go a little deeper with that. When we talk about future proofing schools, future proofing education, reimagining education in this context of preparing for the future, what does that look like, Eric? And now I'm not saying how we define it, but just really in this novel, conceptual, abstract um, answer, what does that look like? Yeah, and I think it's a great question. And I think we can glean a lot of insight by looking at what we've traditionally done. Um, desks and rows, content dissemination, passive consumption, you know, knowledge, 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 content, content, content. Listen, we can access content through Google search, Siri, Alexa, and now artificial intelligence. Content is there, but how do we challenge people, students, adults to think, to think at varying degrees of knowledge taxonomy? But also the key is how do we empower learners to apply their thinking in relevant and meaningful ways? You know, when we think about engagement, we hear so much about engagement. Kids aren't engaged. Kids aren't engaged. I see a lot of compliance. Kids sitting there, taking their notes, listening, but are they engaged in learning? So I think, you know, that higher level of cognition, that relevance, that application is key. Also, when we talk about future proofing, we could say with pretty much, you know, certainty that a one size fits all approach might have worked for us or really did it, but it doesn't work for students today. You know, we have to really look at how we move to more personalized approaches where all learners get what they need, when and where they need it to succeed, as opposed to all students doing the same thing at the same time, the same way, looking at the role of data to group, regroup, provide targeted instruction. Looking at high agency pathways, voice, choice, path, pace, place, maximizing the precious time that we have with learners to support them, not only based on need, but to push those learners that are already at standard and beyond. We also have to look at our spaces. You know, do the spaces and learning environment reflect the actual conditions where they will go into the workforce? You know, looking everything from classroom design, use of outdoor spaces, effective virtual pedagogies. So those are three ways, not new by any means. That's the key. It's not new, but consistency, continuity, but also being honest and vulnerable. It is impossible to change if we're not honest and vulnerable. I don't know. I need help are two keys that are critical to move forward, whether we call it the disruptive world, AC stage of innovation, no matter what we call it, being cognizant and exhibiting this sense of self-efficacy to really help us get over that hump is pivotal. Well stated, Eric. Well stated. Now, as a national thought partner, right, and I want to just kind of shift the thing into school improvement, 
And when we think about strategies for district and school improvement processes, um, we have to start thinking fundamentally different, right? And and now if we're talking about future-proofing schools, when we're talking about the future of education, school improvement is going to look radically different. But you also engage in deep dialogue regarding various problems of practice, other problems of practice in education. So what are the consistent and persistent issues that are common throughout the country? And what strategies would you recommend to curtail those problems of practice in a district or a school regarding school improvement? Yeah, I, I think one is pretty generic, but the most entrenched is the mentality, that's the way I've always done it, or it's working. And I hear that a lot in my work. And my job is to kind of ask the right questions to get people to rethink their practice. Also, I think that systems today are great at collecting data, but there's a lot of opportunities for growth on how to not only leverage that data in PLCs, but also to use it regularly in the classroom. As I referenced before, the data to group, regroup, by target instruction, rotational models, not new by any means, but how does data become a central role, but also how do we begin to integrate those models at the middle and high school levels? You know, another aspect is professional learning. Typically, especially in, in the Northeast, the professional development calendar is like two days to start the year, a few holidays sprinkled in. It's not ongoing. It's not job embedded. Um, you're not looking at evidence. So I think there's opportunities to really improve moving from professional development, something that's done to educators, to professional learning, something that people want to engage in, where there's ongoing feedback, where there's this sense of qualitative evidence to kind of show, here's the professional learning, here how, how it's implemented, and here's how we're changing practice. So I, I think those three areas, just you know, the mindset mentality, data, and professional learning are, are three more uh, realistic areas to kind of begin the process. Yeah, the antiquated structures of uh, traditional professional development and moving to that professional learning, which is ongoing and job embedded. I always say, Eric, that we have to reimagine the organizational culture or even school culture where we're focused on creating a learning organization, right? Yep. Or a learn or a learning institution, i.e., uh, practitioners, um, instructional leaders at the site based level have that ongoing cycle of continuous learning. And I think that um, when we talk about disruptive forces, you know, the traditional PD calendar or the archaic. Uh, Carnegie units, right? S specific hours of instruction mandates that a student have mastered that specific course, or even to the level of standard grades, right? A, B, C, D. What is an A? It might look fundamentally different for Eric uh, than Michael, and two different meanings of an A, but it's still this this large aggregate or quantitative aggregate of we both hit that standard. Um, I still think we need to, again, you know, you said it, creating professional learning environments where now uh, professional learning is ongoing and job embedded, differentiated, just like what we want our instructional practices and methodologies to be uh, with our students. Yeah, it's, it's do, do we model those same expectations that we have for, uh, you know, for our learners, you know, what does it look like from an adult perspective? But, you know, as I'm listening to you, you also kind of indirectly hit on some other practices, you know, you're talking about moving to more competency-based approaches, grading, you know, we have to look at practices that we were forced to do homework, you know, traditional grades, <laughs> um, you know, giving zeros. And we have to really look at just because it was done to us, does it mean that we should still be gravitating to the same practices? Now, I'm not saying homework, get rid of it. I'm saying let's really evaluate. Is it an effective tool to motivate uh, students to learn? When we think about grades, great point. Does a grade actually articulate what a student has learned? And I'm not saying get rid of letters and numbers. I'm saying let's have more transparency and let's really make it something that is a transparent and meaningful. 
uh when we put some practices like like zeros i mean zeros yeah. skew a learner's grade which makes it even more a, a direct uh like a, in, not, not correlated to what that student can actually know and do so i think there's a lot of things but i always try to encourage districts and building leaders to you know focus on one thing and do that one thing really really well and you really when we think about change it shouldn't be a fad it it shouldn't be you know yeah we're gonna dabble in this but really focus on that one aspect that everyone can get on board with that's not new but really maybe it's you know just looking at how we challenge our learners to think which is something they're going to have to be able to do. But also, how does our professional learning reflect that as well? Yeah, uh, Eric, you hit on it. Uh, pedagogy and andragogy, right? But the homework, I think uh, John Hattie and his famous work would uh, challenge the effect size or challenge what homework is, where we know the effect size is very minimal uh, in accordance to his meta-analysis. So, Eric, the discussion with AI and education, it has intensified. You know it. I'm sure you have a lot of education stakeholders, a lot of um, uh, a lot of individuals within the industry really asking deep, um, thought-provoking questions about AI, rightfully so, right? Because it's in alignment with the new demands of the AC stage of education. Now, there are a variety of different perspectives I heard across the country, internationally, guidelines, with regards to ethics, protocols, and standards being uh, developed to support AI in districts. An example that probably you and I uh, know about is the New York City Department of Education. I believe they adopted a policy or it was, I believe, guidelines within the past uh, 60 days. But where should leaders and teachers begin with AI integration when there's so much discussion around this topic? I think it's to really gravitate towards, we can, we always focus on the negatives mm-hmm. and I think the negatives gives an insight onto some of the changes that we need to practice. Oh, students can go get their answers. They get, well, if that's the case, let's really look at the type of questioning and tasks that our learners are engaged in. But I really think the conversation focuses on primarily how can AI save us time? How can it save us time? So that we can really focus more on supporting students and teachers during the in the academic day. And I think it's really being able to provide that clarity on here's how these various tools, whether it's um, ChatGPT, uh, Gemini, uh, Magic School, whatever it is, you know, how can this explicitly help you do what you're already doing better? And I think those guidelines have to be also looking at how we cite information. You know, I I think we have to keep a keen eye on digital citizenship and responsibility. And if something's pulled from AI, which is fine, you know, are we citing it appropriately? Um, Are we also developing, you know, guidelines for students to help guide them on how to use AI effectively to support their learning? So I think with anything new, people want clarity. People want guidance. Um, the just block and ban. Well, that, we all know how that works out with phones. I mean, that's just going to have the adverse effect. But I think people need to really learn how they can leverage things like AI to support core aspects of their work. Great response, Eric. When I when I think of your response, right, I go back to this historical study uh, from Benjamin Bloom in 1984, the Two Sigma problem. And within his study, he identified that if students, or if we want to um, elevate students to standard deviations, right? That's moving uh, a below basic student to uh, on grade level, right? We have to get to this level of one-to-one match. And this was 1984. Now, when we think about 2024, the Two Sigma problem that Benjamin Bloom had identified should not be an issue if we're using AI as a tool, should be considered that Two Sigma opportunity, where now we actually can get to that one-to-one level, where now 
we're bridging, I like to say, or, key, or creating that equilibrium between humans and machines, practitioner and AI. So really should be no excuse on now every student getting a personalized learning experience where now teachers are getting that time back to really effectively implement small group instruction or various modes of um, uh, various modes of instruction within the actual model in itself. Well, what do you think about that, Eric? Well, you hit the nail on the head. I'm so glad you connected the personalization because I recently wrote a blog post on the merits of AI to personalize, especially from just analyzing student data and then providing suggestions to the teacher on the strategies that is unequivocally saves the teacher time. You know, looking at the different preferences of learners and then coming up, asking AI to generate, you know, examples of strategies that could be used, whether in whole group or in uh, tier two intervention, which could be a rotational model or tier three, when students are working on a choice activity, a choice board must do, may do playlists, teachers pulling individual or one or two students and providing intensive support. But, you know, I really like how you connected the personalization because then it, again, that's the hard work. Differentiating before tech was hard work for us that were in school. There was no tech. <laughs> personalization also is not putting all kids on a tool, adaptive tool. I mean, no talking, no discourse, and then not ever looking at the data. So I think that's great ways because, again, time, 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 time. That's the number one thing I hear. That teachers and administrators grapple with. Person, I mean, AI can help save that time, but also to effectively personalize the experience for students. Absolutely. I always say this, Eric, time is the variable, learning is the constant. So now I want to go back to when I was a superintendent during COVID, Eric, and you helped me reimagine professional learning, which was which was a goal in twofold, uh, from a twofold approach. One, we had to do the explicit, create synchronous learning sessions, right? So that we can be able to create a common language of, of instruction uh, during the time of COVID. But two, implicitly, I think this was the great time for experimentation where we were exploring opportunities to use technology to personalize learning for the adult practitioner and site-based instructional leaders. But we know that now, now that we're past the pandemic, that learning can be personalized and differentiated for practitioners and for um, and for leaders when we underscore and underpin AI technology. So, Eric, in the AC stage of education, we have to achieve this level of individualization. We were just talking about that before, that level of personalization for pedagogy and andragogy. Now, if you can, if you could part and parcel those two phenomena, right? student learning, adult learning, how, where do we start to personalize it? And what does it look like from an actionable, uh, actionable steps to reach that vision of individualized, personalized pedagogy and andragogy? Yeah, well, I, I think that it really starts going back to one of the key opportunities for growth, which is professional learning. You know, when we design learning experiences, is it just a drive-by, one-and-done um, you know, siloed uh, tasks, or are we implementing high agency, voice, choice, path, pace, place? Are we beginning to model what that looks like? Because it's, I got to give educators, you know, a little bit of grace because it's hard to ask them to go and do these, implement these strategies if they're not immersed in them. Why, why, why? We always hear about the why. But here's what educators tell me. Eric, we want to know how do we do it and what does it look like? Yeah. And I'll say, here's how others have done it. Here's what it looks like. Your goal to create a true personalized experience is to not do it exactly like them because you have different context. You have a different lens. You have different learners. How do you take the strategy and make it work? I am not a fan of the term best practice. If there was a best practice, we'd all be implementing it with a high degree of fidelity and getting amazing results. I am a huge proponent of effective practices and effective practices are determined by the teacher and the leader who are implementing that in a way that's going to help them to achieve their collective goals. So I think this requires a lot more flexibility. 
uh, requires us to really look at how we structure professional learning. But also when we talk about all this, what does it look like? How do we improve feedback? Is feedback timely, practical, actionable? And that's what teachers tell me all the time that they want from their leaders. They're like, Eric, we want to know how we're doing. We want suggestions on how we can take this to the next level, but we also want validation. We want validation that, yes, we're on the right track. We're doing it well. So professional learning, feedback, evidence libraries, I think are also instrumental. So people can go in and look at different grade levels, uh, different standards, you know, different uh, content areas and really see here are uh, pathways that you can use as a foundation to kind of tweak. Absolutely. Eric, at creating those structures, right? Creating those structures and having those structures where now there's intentional feedback. I think leaders have to be able to prioritize uh, providing that timely feedback and also practical uh, bite sides, right? That teachers can be able to use that in practice. Um, Atul Gwande always talks about, I can't remember in his book, I think it was, it t- takes 10,000 hours uh, for them to master a specific practice. I believe I'm not citing that uh, correctly. I think I am in that area with regards to that. But Eric, last question, my friend, right? And I'm going right. to... Tr- and I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to limit you to three words. Okay. <laughs> three words. Now, people, they, they get very innovative. You talked about it in your last uh, statement that we have to move away from replication and pay attention to the context. So same rules apply, Eric. Replication, we want to stay away from, but take it in context. <laughs> what three words do you want today's VFE audience to leave with regarding the future of education to achieve all. Yeah, I'm going to give you three words, and then I condense them into one. Actions change things. Act. Actions change things. Opinions, words, nope. Act, everybody. Act in the betterment of your learners your staff, systems. So actions change things or just act. Bam! There you go, Eric. Actions change things. So Eric, that's a first. Two seasons of VFV. Three words converted into one. (laughs) And just so everybody, I did not know this question was coming. Dr. Connor did send me the questions, but I might have just maybe just scanned over them briefly and I don't remember seeing that one, so I was not prepared for that. Just so you all know. So don't think that this was, this was scripted. Uh, Eric, it is so good to see you. A lot of my uh, audience, uh, listeners, viewers of VFB, uh, they get in touch with uh, actual participants and uh, guests on the show. Uh, I try to use this as an asynchronous professional learning tool so that they can be able to go back direct instruction, but in an asynchronous manner. So um, if they wanted to reach out to you, how would they be able to contact contact you? Well, I'm everywhere. Uh, every social media tool, type in Eric Scheninger, you'll find me. Uh, ericscheninger.com is kind of my hub. But uh, yeah, you type in my name, you'll, you'll be hard pressed not to find a way to contact me. Eric Scheniger, it is so good to see you, my friend. Thank you for coming on Voices for Excellence. It is truly, truly an honor to have you here. My pleasure, and thank you for the riveting discussion and really helping listeners get outside their comfort zones and kind of push their own mental boundaries so that they can become the best iteration of themselves to support those who they serve. Absolutely, Eric. Thank you again, my friend, and to my audience. Onward and upward, everybody. Have a great evening.